Max Highlights. And here's your host, Louise Houghton. Hello, and thank you for joining us. We're going to start the show today with a bit of classical music. But first, let's give you a quick glimpse of a few of the stories coming up. Art issues. Alex Chinek transforms the facades of buildings. Centuries of style. How fashion has changed for men and women. And iceberg adventure. Amphibious vehicles in Iceland transport tourists around. German violinist Anna Sophie Mutter already has dozens of albums under her belt, but there is something very special about her latest one. Not only does she feature works by Czech composer Antonin Dvořák for the first time, she also recorded the album with the Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra, something she hasn't done with them in over 30 years. The album hit the shelves in Germany last week, so let's have a listen. Anna Sophie Mutter plays Antonin Dvorak's violin concerto with the Berlin Philharmonic, here conducted by Manfred Honig, on her new album. The final recording was actually a run-through one Saturday morning, where we just had 40 minutes left, and I asked the orchestra to play it through one more time, as if there were no tomorrow. And that's how it came about. I'm so glad that we used those 40 minutes as if it were the last concert of our lives. She's played plenty of concerts with the Berlin Philharmonic, but the last time Anna Sophie Mutter recorded an album with them was 30 years ago, when Herbert von Karajan was principal conductor. I've always loved the Berlin Philharmonic, and this is the generation that followed the one I grew up with under Habat von Karajan. It was on December 11th, 1976, that I auditioned with von Karajan, and every time I'm backstage here, I think of it. Herbert von Karajan, who died in 1989, had discovered Anna Sophie Mutter and invited her to play with the Berlin Philharmonic. That launched her international career. Wilfred Schrele was a member of the orchestra back then. There was this 14-year-old girl who played with us at the Salzburg Festival, with von Karajan, Mozart's concerto in G major, and everyone was speechless. It was a miracle. Everyone, the orchestra, the audience, everyone had the feeling that something special was happening. It was as if Mozart had held his hand over her. It was ideal. We were simply fascinated. Anna Sophie Mutter was five years old when she discovered the violin. She was a prodigy and won many awards. She loved Antonin Dvorak's works as a teenager, but this is her first recording of one. I encountered Dvorak early on, like most of the great composers, but with Dvorak it was the romance interpreted by Josef Suk that I first heard at 13. Its vocal character is what makes the violin what it is. It has so many colorful facets, like no other instrument. With Dvorak's violin concerto, 50-year-old Anna Sophie Mutter is rounding out her discography. Now she's recorded all the great violin concertos of the Romantic era. Recently, she was honored for her more than 8 million albums sold. To me, she's truly the queen of violinists. After a break of 30 years, the great violinist and the great orchestra have finally joined forces in a new recording. I could never really understand why someone with such a great career, one of the flagships of the German music business, why a partnership like we had, profitable in every respect, why there was suddenly such a break. Personally, I could never explain it. 
ganz anderen Natur liegen. There must be some reasons of a different nature. But that's made me all the happier that it finally happened again. And I think it was a beautiful, vital, wonderful encounter, which was really fun for both sides. And I hope it will continue, and that we can pick up where we left off back then. Perhaps the new album will mark the beginning of a new era. Herbert von Karajan would probably be pleased to hear it. Moving on, we head to the British seaside town of Margate, which was thriving with holidaymakers from London in the 60s and 70s. When low-cost carriers started taking tourists further afield, the area began to deteriorate. Recently, though, Margate has begun putting itself back on the map. A David Chipperfield-designed exhibition hall is testimony to this renaissance, but it's a large-scale artwork on a quiet residential road that is the current reason why Margate is hitting the headlines. Four floors of typical English red-brick architecture. The perfect house for British artist Alex Chinnick. He finished building work three weeks ago, and the facade looks as if it slipped down into the front garden. I was excited by this idea that this area was once very affluent and the architecture is very grand therefore. However, um, its recent economic struggles have meant that the facades of the building were all incredibly fatigued. And so it was this nice kind of juxtaposition that I thought sat well with what I was trying to do. The 19th century house was empty for 11 years before Alex Chinnick got his hands on it. The conversion cost about 120,000 euros, but the place is still not inhabitable. It's a work of art and a tourist attraction in the small town of Margate. There are so many houses that are sort of decaying around here, and then all of a sudden there's a proper house just sliding into the road. It's brilliant. I think it would be better suited for people living in it. <laughs> You know, if it would provide somebody with a roof over their head that would otherwise be homeless, then it's got to be better being a house, isn't it? The work that's gone into it is incredible, and the thought that's gone into it. And for anything like this in Margate, is, is a good thing. Urban decay is an ongoing theme for Alex. This old factory in the East End of London was last used for the illegal cultivation of cannabis. Its facade is now part of a work of art but you have to look closely to see it. All 300 panes of glass have been broken identically. It took 1,200 panes to get it right. My work is kind of playful and there's a silliness to it and I do use these simple pleasures of illusion and humor. This narrative of a building falling down or windows being smashed, uh, I think sobers the, the, uh, the, the kind of optimism of the work. Alex lives and works in a former factory. He studied painting, but most of his projects are related to architecture. He's currently choosing bricks for his latest work, a facade in London. The 29-year-old lives from his art. His projects are largely financed by donations from building companies and often require months of planning. The aesthetic decisions are such a small part of the process. Um, and so often I, I, I don't feel like an artist. Um, I, I feel it's almost business and it's a long, long process of negotiation. So these things have to go through planning permission um, and we had to discuss that with the local councils. The paperwork for his Blackfriars Road project in London is in the bag. Every day thousands of people pass his construction site unaware of the artwork emerging behind the scaffolding. In a few days' time, the last brick will be laid and his upside-down house will be ready. Any audience member, anybody walking past the building can see the work, understand the work and enjoy the work, irrespective of their education or previous cultural experience, whether they're artists or whether they're, they've never made any art in their life. And I think public art has that great responsibility. Alex Chinnick wants his art to draw attention to urban issues. In a year's time, his house in Margate will be gone 
replaced by a new inhabitable house built up from the ruins. Now, it's surprising how much fashion has changed over the years, and no one knows that better than Munich professor Barbara Finken. Her experiences in the world of fashion have led to her writing books on the subject, and her latest release gives readers an insight into the evolution of women showing a bit of leg. Long legs, a slim figure, and elegant poise. Such is the typical ideal of feminine beauty today. But some 200 years ago, those same features were associated with the male sex. Back then it was always military men who had the longest legs and most beautiful tights. The look for women's legs today has something of the aggressive boldness of those military men. Barbara Finken is a professor of literature at the Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich. Dubbed Germany's most glamorous professor by the media, she's been studying fashion trends past and present for nearly two decades. She has written extensively on the subject. Her latest book, Angezogen, or Dressed, examines the fundamentals of fashion. In this day and age, you can certainly say that women's fashion draws from men's. Coco Chanel put it best when she said, all my life I've done nothing but convert men's fashion into women's fashion. Finken says that up until the French Revolution, men were actually the fairer sex. They wore high-heeled shoes to give them a better grip in the stirrups, and silk stockings to accentuate the shape of the leg. But with the advent of the suit, the days of courtly flamboyance were over. It was Philippe, Duke of Orléans, who began the trend. He was the first nobleman to wear sans-culotte, the clothes of the working man. Since then, menswear has generally covered up the legs. Women gradually started to reveal more leg, but Barbara Finken believes that unlike the historic subtext of a man in stockings, a woman who reveals her legs is not seen as authoritative. I think a lot needs to happen before the general public accepts empowered femininity in positions of power. In Germany, there is extreme intolerance toward femininity in the public arena. It's generally seen as a trait that cares for nothing except clothes. That may explain why German Chancellor Angela Merkel opts for trouser suits, in line with the uniform of her male colleagues. Many designers challenge the perception that women in high places need to dress like a man. They see no contradiction between femininity and authority. Barbara Finken begs to differ. She would like to see more flexibility, more masculinity in women's fashions, and vice versa. Fashion does two things. It stipulates gender roles, but at the same time shows they can also be reversed, and that they're not linked to a natural identity. And that's the playful aspect, the subversive and ingenious potential of fashion, that it doesn't take itself too seriously. Barbara Finken believes it is not fashion that defines gender, but a person's inner attitude. And who knows, maybe high heels one day will no longer be off-limits for men. Well, when that happens, I'm sure no one will believe it. But it's always amazing how quickly a trend catches on. Moving on then, we're taking a closer look at the production of saffron. Iran actually harvests 90% of it, but the second largest exporter of the spice is Spain. A region in the heartland of this country is famous for it, and the people there have recently been celebrating their harvest season, a time of year when everyone clubs together to cultivate this luxury spice. Saffron, or red gold, can cost up to 20 euros a gram. The spice is sourced from the flowers of a species of crocus that blossoms for just a few weeks a year. These fields in southern Spain have been a family-run business for centuries. It's a very delicate flower that needs to be handled with tender loving care. We harvest them in late October or early November, depending on the weather. Alternating rain and sunshine is good, but too much rain or cold can ruin the bulbs. The stigmas have to be picked by hand, making production labor intensive. It takes 250,000 stigmas to make just one kilo of saffron, hence the high price. 
but you still can't make enough to live off of. Saffron is not our main source of income. It's not enough to live off of, but it does boost our budget. The harvest is a huge help, especially in times of crisis. Once the flowers have been picked, villagers are employed to separate the stigmas, quickly but carefully. They have to be fresh, with no yellow pollen attached. The final step is to roast the stigmas, which releases the 150 aromas. It's a special time of year for the locals. It unites the family. We do everything together. Families eat together at the table, and work on the harvest together. And the saffron harvest is like a celebration. The Castilla-La Mancha region is famous for its wine, for its windmills, and for the fictitious character Don Quixote who charged them. The area is also home to Las Provincias, a restaurant that serves traditional Spanish fare such as paella, in which rice is dyed yellow using saffron. It's crushed by hand to retain the taste. Emma Comanero's menu includes many of her own saffron creations, both sweet and savory. There's creme brulee with saffron, or hake in a saffron sauce. For thousands of years, saffron has been used as a spice, as a dye, as a fragrance, and for medicinal purposes. These days, it's used mostly in top restaurants. It's very strong. The aroma is just as intense as the color. So only very simple dishes are suitable for saffron, with basic ingredients like cake, which is a white fish. You would never use saffron on salmon. A delicate and dear flower, where a little goes a long way. For just a few more days, it will continue to light up the fields of Castilla-La Mancha in vibrant violet. Back in the 1950s, the US military developed the Lark 5, an amphibious vehicle capable of transporting five tons. Some of them are now privately owned and being used in Iceland to take tourists around Vatner Jökull, which is the largest glacier in Europe. They're based at the Jökull Salon Lake, so they can be used as they were intended, both on land and on water. Now, whilst this is an informative and fascinating trip, it does make you realise the effects of global warming. It's a bus and a boat. A 375 horsepower diesel engine drives the Lark 5 amphibious vehicle on land and water. Tourists ride it through the barren landscape of southeastern Iceland. The Lark 5 bounces across about one kilometer of gravel road and then drives straight into the icy water at the edge of Iceland's biggest glacier, Vatnajökull. The boat tour is only possible if the route is mostly ice-free, and quite often it isn't. At close to 250 meters depth, the lake is Iceland's deepest. The lagoon itself, now being around 25 square kilometers, uh, is growing each year. Uh, the whole process started around eight years ago only, so before that time it's been all solid ice. Now it's getting bigger and bigger every year, around 100 meters this direction, so it's a very fast process. Helpers are out in the lagoon in four rubber dinghies pushing chunks of ice out of the Lark 5's way. The greater part of the icebergs are underwater, and there's a constant danger that they could turn over. So though they have dinghies to help them, the skipper always keeps a safe distance from the bergs.
The other interesting fact about this ice is that it's very compressed. It's around five times more compressed than the ice that we can find in our freezers. Also because of that, uh, when it's big enough, uh, it's like for example this huge one behind me, uh, it starts to have this ability to bounce back the light. The tour only takes about 45 minutes. It ends with a taste of genuine glacier ice, which the tour guide says is at least a thousand years old. Now, as it's only a few weeks till International Men's Day, we set out to explore what it is to be a man in today's modern world. Does a man still need to be the one to make the first move? Does he still need to be the breadwinner in the family? It seems that there's been a shift in gender roles of late, which can make it harder for men to find their own identity. <laughs> From classic charmers to modern metrosexuals, from macho men to thinking woman's heartthrob or loving husband and father. Men's identity has never been so multifaceted. The traditional role of the career guy working his entire adult life to feed his family needs some revising. Today's male needs new qualities. Being attentive, knowing when his woman's down, and being able to cook too. <laughs> he just needs to be able to deal with emancipated women and forget traditional gender roles. That's a tall order of expectations for a man, says 37-year-old columnist Matthias Lohre. His new book takes a tongue-in-cheek look at changing male roles and the prejudices of the modern woman. On the one hand, they want men to understand women's issues. At the same time, many men are told they're incapable of even having emotions, let alone showing them. It's a dilemma you can't escape. Over half of women in Germany expect men to pursue a career. But two-thirds also want their better half to help around at home and spend more time with the family. These are findings from a recent survey in Germany. The results also suggest that one in three men feels overwhelmed by that dual role. That figure rises to one in two among single men. Experts say the conflict is the result of the emancipation of women. We've caught up on the education front. We continue to have a stronger presence on the job market. The big question is how to reorganize a relationship, and then childcare, and then household duties. All new stuff. Things that used to be so straightforward have now become a challenge for couples. For the majority of men in Germany, working less is out of the question. Just 7% take a year off to focus on child rearing at home. That said, three quarters do take a two month parental leave, which inevitably has an impact on how domestic duties are shared out. That's not a bad thing, says Matthias Lohre. The problem is, yeah. Men and women don't want to relive those images from 50 years ago. There's a growing tendency among men to say, I want to find fulfillment outside my job too. Nobody wishes on their deathbed that they'd spent more time at the office. Those growing expectations on men are a growing topic of public debate. Men are under more pressure, but now also have more options to turn to for help and advice. What kind of men do we want to be? With what values? It involves genuine emancipation from outside demands, from society, your boss, your buddies or your wife. How can men achieve that? Regardless of whether we're talking traditional or metrosexual or modern, what is it that makes them happy? So, the solution to gender role conflict is... Be a team player.
It sounds like they need to get everything right. So to add in another argument, dare I say that maybe women have just become a bit more demanding? On that note, I will leave you for today, but until next time, take care and goodbye.